welcome your presence tonight. We thank you that you are here. Lord, we thank you that you are an ever-present help in trouble. God, I thank you that uh, you're here tonight with us as we worship you. But you're here in every moment of our lives. You are there and you are near to us. Lord, I pray that we'll be faithful to call on you and to trust in you with whatever is going on in our lives. As we begin a new year, Lord, we want to be faithful to you because we know that you are faithful uh, to us. Lord, meet our needs tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd feed us with your uh, word this evening. I pray that you'd encourage our hearts with our fellowship uh, together uh, tonight. Let everything we do bring glory to the name of Jesus. And let us enjoy being in your presence tonight. In Jesus' name. Him together. Come now, fount of every blessing. sins, 
Jesus made us alive with him in Christ. Let's sing this verse again. Old truth lost in utter darkness Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin When your love came and set me free Now my soul your prayer tonight. Let's sing it again.
Fall fresh tonight, Holy Spirit. Do a fresh work in our lives. Do a fresh work in your church. God, speak to us through your word. Let it be alive and cut uh, to the deep places in our hearts. Bring conviction, bring change, bring fresh life, new life. We pray in Jesus' name. Good evening. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 9 in just a moment. I want to talk about the the knowledge of God's will tonight. And um, as we read through His Word, I, I hope you'll begin to see some principles through His his word about how we discern and apply the knowledge of, of God's will. Now, our pastor is out tonight. He um, called me um, just a few nights ago and said he had an emergency that came up and he would be um, <clears throat> out, had to go south to some meeting that just came up. Um, and um, he's, um, uh, we'll just be praying for him as he's uh, down in Tampa for some. <laughs> So I'm meeting tomorrow night. He had to drive down there. He's at the national championship, and um, he'll, uh, he'll be enjoying his time uh, fellowship with some brothers, and, and so it'll be a good time for him. And, uh, you know, he, he's not away much. You know, he has a passion for football. And, um, but he told me at the beginning of the season, he says, now, if, if we make it all the way, I'm going to Tampa. I was all right. And so when they won the game last week, I got the call just after this. All right, be ready to preach. I said, okay, I'm, I'll be ready to go. So, uh, so he's down there having a, uh, have a good time with his buddy Ken Whitten from Ottawa Baptist Church. And um, be, be, be praying that uh, they have a safe trip, him and Robert Dunn, as they travel. And God brings them back safe as well. And um, however the game turns out, I know how the people in my house want it to turn out, but, you know, that's kind of immaterial. Just, you know, that he has a good time. Well, let's uh, look at the word of the Lord. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And so let me just stop right there and make a quick comment. So you see that there's the first step is the knowledge of His will. And that's knowing about the the will of the Lord, knowing about God, knowing things about our Lord. But then the next step goes beyond that, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fulfilled in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. And I want to stop right there. And so I want to talk about the will of the Lord. And as we begin 2017, about our prayer for this new year should be that we understand God's will. We understand it, and we know it, but we also apply it, and we follow it, and we pursue the will of the Lord. And so our prayer should be for the knowledge of God's will. And we see Paul was praying that, um, asking for the Colossian church that they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. When we think of the will of God, there are really three attitudes that you can have toward it. One is that you're unconcerned about knowing God's will. You really... I don't want to know what God's will is, because if you know something, then all of a sudden you're obligated. And so there's a lot of people that they really don't want to know God's will, because if, if it's revealed to them, that means they've got to do something. And so they're afraid to know His will. They really don't want to be aware of that. And the next one would be, they know God's will, but they've decided, I'm not going to do God's will. Perhaps they're saying, this is going to cost me too much. Uh, maybe this isn't the right season for, for, for me to do this. I'm not going to do God's will. And then, of course, the third would be, whatever God says to do, I'm going to do that. That's obedience. And so when we think about God's will, oftentimes I have people say, well, I just want to know what God's will for my life is. You know, the Bible is full of the revelation of God's will. And there are several things that we can see in the Word of God about His will, His revealed will biblically. One is that all people should be saved. That is His will. We're told that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that it's God's will that all people would come to salvation. Also, it's um, part of God's will that all Christians share their faith. That's why we're told to be baptized. 
that we would openly declare what God has done for us, that we would be sharing our faith, declaring, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ. And the third thing, that we would live pure lives. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let me just briefly read that um, to you. Um, verses 3 through 5, listen to what Paul writes to Thessalonians about living pure lives. Verses 3 and 4 of chapter 4. For this is the will of God, there it is, the will of God, your sanctification, that you would be set apart, you'd be sanctified. And so if you want to know what God's will is, it's for you to be a holy person, to be sanctified. And he goes on and explains what he means by that. He says um, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you should possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And so if you know God through the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand his will for you is that you would be a holy person, live a pure life. The next one would be that you be part of a con and contributing to a church. There's a lot of Christians who think, well, it's kind of optional to be a part of a church. But the Bible is very clear that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We don't get to just say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live how I want to live. I don't need to really be a part of a church. Uh, it could just be me and Jesus. You know, I can just, you know, go and uh, go to the deer stand, and I can be close to God. I can play golf on Sunday, and I'll be close to God. Or I can just stay home. And that is an unbiblical perspective for a Christian. Because the Bible also says in 1 Timothy 3.15 that the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. And so if you want truth being spoken into your life, you, you've got to have that not only through Scripture, but also through the church. The church speaks truth into your life. So it's, it's God's will that you be a part of the body life of the church. And then it's His will that you be Spirit-filled, full of the Spirit. And so as we think about the will of God and the knowledge of the will of God, I want us to, um, to look at some principles that we find in Scripture about the will of God and gaining knowledge. Number one, let's talk about knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing. I love learning. I've been to school a lot. I, I enjoy reading, and knowledge is a good thing. But we've got to be careful because Paul tells us that knowledge puffs up. And so, first of all, knowledge for knowledge's sake is a spiritual trap. And there's a lot of Christians who fall into that trap, who begin to think, well, I'm just going to read and go to seminars, and I'm going to send it to teaching and preaching, and that is what I'm supposed to do. And they get all this knowledge, and they never do anything with it. And they just soak it in and soak it in, and, and, and before long, they become like the Dead Sea. They've got water running in, but nothing ever goes out, and they become just a, a dead place. And so you must be a person who not just you're gaining knowledge, but you're doing something with that knowledge. It is not fruitfulness just to gain knowledge. You must be doing something with the knowledge that God has given to you. See, knowledge also must be seen as something that is transformational and not just something that is for saturation. It's for transformation, not just for saturation. It's not just something that we collect, that we, we go and we get um, all these notebooks from seminars, and, and we can say, I've learned all this, and I've got this degree, and I've been here, and I've taken this class, because that is not transformational. Because if you're not using that knowledge, something is wrong. And you have begun to fall into the trap of believing that you know, fruitfulness is about collecting and obtaining knowledge. And so knowledge can only take you so far in your spiritual development. I've run into many Christians who take great pride in their ability to read deep theological works and quote great authors of the past and understand Greek words and Hebrew words and all this. And that stuff's good. But then when you look at them and you don't see any fruit in their life, you have to say there's something wrong here. There's something wrong when your passion is just to learn and to learn and to learn, but never to do the, wor the word and the will of God. Reading after dead theologians is a, is a good thing. I've got some favorites. 
Um, I have people I, I love to read after. But there's got to come a point to where you take what you've learned and you begin to apply it. And you begin to, to put it into action. And if we find ourselves just simply gaining knowledge for knowledge's sake and just find ourselves saying, I just want to know the deep things of God, but yet we don't do the basics, and we don't put into action what God has called us to do, something is wrong. The deepest Christians I know are some of the most simple people you'd ever meet. And they simply take the knowledge that they have of God's word and they put it into practice. These people have learned that if you want to grow deeper in the Lord, you've got to, you've got to do what he's called you to do. When we look in the scriptures and we see those people who God revealed deep things to, it was the obedient. It was the people that were doing what God said to do. It was Abraham whenever God said, I want you to go, and he went. It was Elijah when he was called, and he, he went, and he did. It, it was Moses. And, and these men and the women of Scripture, we see when they were doing the, the, the little things and being obedient, God began to reveal himself in greater ways. And so if you want to know more about God, if you want to know the deep things of God, then begin doing the small things and the basic things and the fundamentals. Oftentimes, I've heard people say, you know, I, I, I used to go to that church, but I wasn't being fed there. And when I hear that, I, I just have to wonder what was really going on there. Because so often, Christians aren't being fed because they're not being obedient. Because you remember what Jesus said about his spiritual food. Because remember the disciples came and said, Lord, you need to eat. And he says, well, my food is to do the will of my Father. And so often we find people who say, well, I'm just not being fed. But they're not doing what God has called them to do. And if they would do the work and the will of God, what they know, he would feed them even more. And they wouldn't have any problem sitting in a church and under a teacher or a preacher because they would be being fed from the hand of God because they were doing what God called them to do. It's, um, it's like my experience um, at the YMCA. I was a, a counselor there um, when I was in college. And um, in the summertime, we had just kids everywhere. And we had the open pool and we had all these counselors in the pool. And there were all these little children who didn't know anything about swimming. And they would all be in the shallow end, they'd have their floaties on, and it was just pandemonium. And inevitably, every one of those children would want to go to the deep end of the pool because they didn't want to stay in the shallow end. And every one of them thought, I can, I can go to the deep end. And they had to say, no, you can't go to the deep end, you can't cross this little line because you, you can't swim. My girls have been the same way. We take them to Lake Martin every year, and, and they're just, a few years ago, they got to the point where they could all swim. But before that, it was just, it was so... Um, tense field because our daughters would want to take off the life vest and they wouldn't want to wear their floaties and they were like we can swim and they couldn't swim and they wanted to get out in the deep and there's so many Christians who think they ought to be out in the deep and yet they've never learned to the basics of, of swimming theologically speaking they're not doing what God has called them to do and yet they're arrogant enough to believe that I ought to be in the deep end. I need the deep things of God. And yet they're not doing the very fundamentals, the very basics that will take them into the deep things of God. I mean, it's like, you know, we've all been to kindergarten. Now, I don't know about you, but my kindergarten teacher, she didn't walk in and say, okay, kids, today I'm going to teach you trigonometry. We're going to um, ex ex explore the nuances of the Pythagorean theorem. I'm going to expose you to Keynesian economics today. Because, you know, uh, all of us little children sit there, you know, we're picking our noses and looking off into space and doing all that. And we'd been like, what are you talking about? No, she went in and she said, okay, one plus one equals. So you have one apple plus another apple. How many do you have? And of course, you know, some kid raise their hand. Well, and they start telling some story about their dad to having apples and eating apples and all, you know, and it's just, you know, and, and because the children don't understand and they're, they're just, they're, you know, they're babes. And you got to start them out with the basics. 
And before long, after they've begun to do math and they move through elementary school and into middle school, and before you know it, they're in high school and they're doing trigonometry and they're doing calculus and algebra, but they had to learn the basics first. And so many Christians have heard the basics, they've seen the basics, they've read the basics, and yet they don't want to do the basics. They want the deep things of God, and yet the deep things of God are off limits to them because they simply will not do what God has called them to do. James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 22, he says this, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. And then he puts this little tagline on the end. He says, deceiving yourselves. Those who are not doers of the word are deceived. Just because you're hearing the word and maybe reading the word and you're under a great teacher or a great preacher, if you're not doing what you know and what you've been exposed to, you have been deceived and you've deceived yourself into thinking that somehow I am pleasing the Lord and he is happy with what I'm doing, that I'm doing his will when you're not doing his will. His will is to do the things he calls us to do. And so when we read his word and we want to know what his word says, and it says that we're to, to be a part of the, a church, are you being a part of, of, of a church? Are you working? Are you exercising your gifts? Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Are you tithing? Are you sharing your faith? Are you finding ways to be on mission for the Lord? Or are you a person who spends time in prayer? Are you a, a, a person who regularly finds ways to fast and seek God? The basics that we see in Scripture, are we doing those things or are we saying, how come God's not speaking to me and I'm not understanding more deeper things? Well, the question then becomes, are you doing the things that he's called you to do from the very start, the the, the fundamentals, so to speak? And and that's the, the, the next thing is that knowledge is the starting point of our spiritual life, the fundamentals. It's the starting point. It's not the ending. A lot of people think, well, you know, I, the more I know, that's, that's where I'm going. No, knowing about God is the starting point because the more you know, then the more you should be doing. This morning in the foyer, I saw my, my old basketball coach, Murray Rutledge. And, um, you know, Coach Rutledge was a, was a good coach, and he taught us the fundamentals. I had him as my JV coach, and he became a varsity coach. And, you know, There wasn't ever a time where Murray Rutledge pulled me aside and said, Stan, okay, today I'm going to teach you how to dunk a basketball. He never, ever did that. Now, you know, to dunk a basketball is pretty spectacular. I mean, the crowd gets into it. Everybody, you know, roars and goes wild. And it's just, it's it's a phenomenal thing to be able to do. And nobody really gets all that excited about a layup. But a layup counts the same as a, as a dunk. You know what Murray Rutledge talked about in playing basketball? He says, look, teams that do the fundamentals win games. Those who can make the free throws, those who can make their layups. When you follow your shot after you shoot, and you go and you rebound. If you box out, you know, and, and, and you get the rebound. Those are the fundamentals. That's what we're going to work. We worked on those every single day. I mean, it was shooting free throws all the time. It was doing layups. It was working plays over and over and over again. It was just the fundamentals. And that's what a good coach teaches is the fundamentals. He doesn't teach the spectacular. He never once taught me how to put the ball behind my back and, and dribble through my, my legs. And all. I could do that stuff, but he didn't teach me that. You know, I mean, I thought that's really cool to be able to do this kind of stuff, but you know, that didn't win basketball games. What won basketball games was good defense, was, uh, you know, cutting the guy off on the baseline, was running the play right, was making that layup. That was what won the basketball games, was the fundamentals. And so often in the Christian life, we know what the fundamentals are, and we think, well, that's just, that's just basic stuff. And yet we're not doing it. And we think, well, we need something deeper than this. When we're not doing the very fundamentals that takes us into the deeper walk. And so if you want to know what the will of the Lord is, well, first of all, it comes from Scripture. That's the, the knowledge that comes down from above. That, that is guidance from above, the Scriptures. And, and, and you have a copy of this. We live in an amazing time where we have literacy and the ability 
to, to be able to read God's Word for ourselves. And yet, with the availability of God's Word and the freedom to have it and to read it, how often do we avail ourselves of our ability to read as well as the availability of God's Word and ingest it and learn about the Word and the will of the Lord? It, it's, it's something that we as a privilege we have, but also we know the will of God through the saints, those around us. We need each other. This afternoon I was struggling with an issue, and I was with a brother, and he just spoke to me, and he said something, and it was like that was confirmation of something that I needed to do. And we all need the saints. If you want to know the will of God, you need to get with brothers and sisters, godly people who can speak into your life and help you and give you perspective. Not people with an agenda, not people that, you know, they're not hardly even living for God and they, they hadn't cracked a Bible, but godly people who can, you can sit down and pray with me and help me understand this is what I'm struggling with, this is what I'm doing, I'm going to make this decision about this, and they can speak truth into your life. The saints. Scripture, the saints, but also the Spirit. That's guidance that comes from within. That is the peace that passes understanding. When you're dealing with something and you need to know the will of God and, and, and the Spirit speaks into your life and He gives you a peace and you simply know this is what the Lord has told me to do. I have a good friend right now. He's, um, he's taking me to Nepal um, in, in a few months. And he told me, he said, Stan, I just believe God spoke to me to go. And, and as we began to pray about this, it was obvious that God had given him a peace and he lined up a person for him to get in contact with, and he began to just make all the pieces fall into place. And, and, and God was calling this man to go, and, and he asked me to go with him, and we're going to take a, a young man who's going to be shooting some video of a pastor who's being persecuted over there. And, and, and there's a peacefulness about all of, of, of this trip, which I'll be honest with you, I, I really wasn't um, all that excited about going to Nepal flying from here to JFK, from JFK all the way into China, and China over to, you know, whatever that city is that you fly to. And um, Sean does a lot of work in Tibet as well. And, um, but you know, as I've prayed through this and I've seen God work in this man's life, there's been a peace that's come in to my life about this. And it's the Holy Spirit saying, this, this is my will, it's what I want you to do. When you think of the will of God, he gives us ways for us to know what his will is. The scriptures, the saints, but also the spirit speaking to us and, and giving us peace. You know, the, the writer of Hebrews talks about the fundamentals. In Hebrews chapter 5, li listen to these words that the writer of Hebrews, I don't know who the writer of Hebrews was, um, We'll find out one day, and that'll be one of the great mysteries will we'll, we'll be unveiled in, in heaven. But chapter 5 of, of Hebrews, verse 11 says this, of whom I have, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. These are people that were no longer really hearing what the will of the Lord was. Something had happened to them. For though by this time you ought to be leaders or teachers or instructors, you need someone to teach you again the first principles, the fundamentals of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. He says, you're just a baby. You're an infant who's throwing a fit, demanding food, and all you can take is just the basic nourishment because you've not grown any. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word and of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use, they've been doing what God called them to do. They've been, they've been about the will of the Lord. Reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so, how do we know the will of the Lord? Well, we, we do God's will. We do the fundamentals, and he unveils his will even more, and he begins to show us even more, and then we do that. And when we've done that, we, we do even more. And the more he shows us, the more we learn, and the more we understand, and the deeper we go with the Lord. And so knowledge is the starting point 
of our walk. But then understanding God's will is the first thing, but also the next thing, our prayer should be not just for the the knowledge of of the, the will of God, but also the knowledge of the work of God. Verse 10 back in Colossians chapter 1 says that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. Increasing in the knowledge of God, a fruitfulness, being um, a person who works out what God has called them to do. So how do you please God? You please him by doing what he called us to do. See, it, it re- work, you know, and, 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 and following God's will requires some effort. It requires you doing what he said do. Not just knowing about it, not just wanting to do it but actually taking a step out there and pleasing him the way he's called us to do that. Sometimes we, um, we think we please God by just, like I said, just knowing things. But it's more than that. It's by putting into action what God's called us to do. I mean, it, it's kind of like my dog. The other day, um, I came home about 5.30, and um, I was a little, you know, I get home that time most days. And, and as I pulled in the garage... I got out of my car, and I went to grab the doorknob. I heard my wife. She, never, she doesn't I ever really hear her yell, but she was yelling this day. And I heard her yell these words, Where is your father? And, you know, I, I almost didn't open the door. I was like, <clears throat> all right, so what's going on, or what have I done that I don't know I, I did? <clears throat> and so I opened the door, and I was like, well, what's going on? There's my sweet wife, and she's looking at our table, <clears throat> and <clears throat> our dog, who thought he was doing a good thing, um, had caught a squirrel outside. And somehow, I still don't really understand how this happened. Somehow, he got the squirrel in the house. <clears throat> and so I looked, and, and there's the dog under the table with this tail sticking out of his mouth, and this squirrel kind of jammed up in his, in his mouth there. And Kristen is not happy about this. And he's not going to let go of the squirrel because he thought he's doing a good thing. He's proud of, of, you know, of his catch. Um, and you know, he thought, man, everybody ought to be happy. But mom's not happy. And so he didn't understand that. And so you know, I had to kind of get under the table and get him. And he was kind of skeptical about what I was going to do. He didn't want the squirrel taken away. And so I picked him up. And walked him outside and put him down, and he's just glaring at me like, don't take my squirrel. This is what I'm supposed to do. I caught the squirrel. And so I just left him alone, you know. And then eventually he, you know, dropped the squirrel. I got him inside, and I went and buried the thing. And he thought he'd done a good thing. But he'd done a bad thing, according to Christian. They bring that thing in the house. And oftentimes we're like that. We think I'm pleasing God because... I know this, and I've been to this seminar, and I've learned this, and I've learned that, but yet we're not doing what God's really called us to do. And so work pleases God. Doing God's work, what he's called us to do, pleases him. But also work requires, I mean, if if we work, we're going to bear fruit. You, You should be bearing fruit as a Christian. The moment you become a Christian, you should start bearing fruit. That's why you're, you're called to be baptized, because you're bearing a witness and you're bearing fruit. People see that and they're curious, and, and those who are not believers and say, well, I want to know more about that, because I knew that person, and now they're doing something that seems kind of crazy, and, and they're becoming all religious. I want to know more about what's going on, and then they begin to learn about that, and they realize the power of God has come in that person's life, and the witness that is presented takes effect in their life, and fruit is born, and it's because we are working for the Lord. Fruit takes work; it really does. It takes effort. It's like you know, it's like a peach tree. You know, a peach tree is kind of a curious thing. If you were to drive up north, go to you know Montgomery, and just north of Montgomery, there's a place called Clanton. There's a big peach on the top of a water tank there. You know, it's it's a, it's a, a funny looking thing, and that's kind of a geographical oddity right there Clanton is because when you see how the weather patterns are it's colder there in Clanton than it is in Montgomery or Birmingham and there's a lot of peaches there because it's kind of a perfect place because peach trees need between 25 to 38 days of cold weather below 40 degrees which is kind of hard on the tree 
But in order for them to bear fruit, they've got to go through this hard winter time. And the colder it is, the better it is. Until it gets below zero, then it can damage the wood. So, that, you know, they've got, to, they've got to go through a tough time. And if, if we're going to bear fruit, sometimes we've got to go through the coldness, and we've got to go through the heat, and we've got to go through the winter, and we've got to go through some tough times to bear fruit. Bearing fruit requires work and effort. It's not just something that just happens. It's something that we must dedicate ourselves to. We must be willing to work for the Lord and follow after his will. Doing God's will in this culture is difficult and getting harder every day. Doing the will of God will cost you. It'll cost you standing. It may cost you friends or family members. It may cost you your job. It's going to cost you maybe minor harassment or people looking at you like, why would you do that? It may cost you opportunities. The will of God will cost you. It, it, it takes work to do that because everything is moving against us. The flesh is telling us don't do that. The world is saying that is crazy. You don't need to be doing this. Work and fruit bearing go hand in hand. And also, we must work to grow and know more about God. The more we work, the more we know. The more we know, the more we want to work. And those things just go hand in hand, and we grow in the Lord. And so, the last thing I want us to, to look at, we need to know His will, we need to know His work, but also we need to know His ways. Verse 11 says, Strengthen in all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. And there's three elements there that show God's ways. Patience, long-suffering, and joy. And those seem incompatible. Long-suffering and joy don't seem to go together. I mean, you know, if you're suffering, how can you be joyful? Patience and joy don't seem to go together. If you've got to be patient and wait, I mean, if you're sitting out in the car having to wait, you know, on somebody in your house, you know, and they're not coming... You, you don't usually, doesn't make you very happy. But spiritually speaking, we should be patient people. We should be long-suffering people and also joyful people. And those things are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand together. And those are the ways of God. When I was learning to, to fly, uh, I may have mentioned this before. I hope I've not repeated this illustration, but I, my, my instructor was a terrible instructor. I mean, he, he really was awful. He didn't really care about I was his only student. I always thought he was a drug runner because he had this big plane. He'd fly at night, and I was his only student, and he'd take me out. And he really didn't talk a whole lot about flying. He was kind of like, whatever. And after about eight hours of, of instruction, he just got out one day and said, all right, start flying. And I was lost as a goose. I mean, I was just, you know, and he, he said, I want you to go up, and I want you to do all these stalls. And I'm thinking... What in the world? I mean, I was terrified. And so there was an old man who had a bunch of planes um, there at the little um, place I learned to fly, coastal aviation. His name was Davis Glass, and he was a retired um, Air Force colonel. He'd flown A-1 Sky Raiders and B-52s in Vietnam. And, um, and so one day, I mean, I was sitting there, and I was getting ready to take the little 172 up and fly, and I was just, I didn't want to do it. And I was like, this is crazy. And so I got out of the plane, I walked down where Colonel Glass's hangars were, and I, and, and I said, well, Colonel Glass, can I talk to you about something? He said, what's going on? I said, well, look, Mike wants me to go, you know, out and do all these stalls, and I don't have a clue how to do them, and I'm afraid I'm going to kill myself. And he said, hey, let's go fly. So he pulled his little 150 tail dragger out of the hangar, and he says, jump in. And so we took off, and we start flying, and he's, the whole time, explain to me about a power on stall and a power off stall and all this stuff. And he says, let me just show you how to do this. And he walked me through all these, you know, these stall maneuvers. And he showed me the way to get out of the stall and, and, and what to do in these emergency situations. And after learning the ways, I, was, I felt so confident that I could go and take a plane up. And even today, it's been decades since I've flown a plane. I feel like I could, if I got into a situation 
Um, and I was in a little aircraft, and all of a sudden, it was, it was, I heard the, stall, the horn go off. I could get myself out of the stall. Now, I mean, I could land the thing you know, now, but I could get out of the stall because I learned the ways that Davis Glass taught me of getting out of that emergency situation. And the same thing goes for us as believers. We must learn the ways of God. And patience and long-suffering and joy are the ways of God. Because it's the patience that we see in our Lord Jesus' life that he had waiting on us. Those who were against him and hostile to him and how he was patient with us and, and he waited for us to respond to his, his grace. And we did. And we, we must be patient people with, with those around us. We must be patient people with, with those who are hostile toward us and who have rejected the faith. And we must be praying for them and patient with them, but also long-suffering as well. We see the long-suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he suffered agony for us. And, and we must be willing to be um, counted as those who suffer for the Lord because Paul says it's a privilege to be counted to suffer for his name. And to be people who are willing to suffer for him, that's something that, that's, that's one of the ways of God because through that suffering, the Lord teaches us and purges us and prunes us and grows us. And, and, and we, um, we, um, we see his, his glory through, through suffering. And then there's joy. Joy. Not happiness. Not, you know, Kind of every day something good happens and boy, that makes me happy. But, but true joy that comes from knowing what we've been given. Knowing what God has done for us. Knowing of where he took us to where we are now. What we've been translated to. From being a lost person to being a saved person. From having no inheritance to having an incredible inheritance. To having no life in the future to having eternal life. Joy. And I'll be honest with you. Two of these I, I do okay with. Spiritually, I'm a, I'm a pretty patient person when it comes to, to people and, and seeing what God can do in someone's life. The long-suffering part, you know, God taught me through my experience as a pastor about suffering. And, and, and I did okay with that. That kind of resonated with me. This last one, though, of joy, that's where I struggle. Because I'm kind of naturally on the melancholy side. And I tend to look at the, the bad. And I tend to go to the negative, And I tend to see the worst case scenarios. And I tend to forget what God has done for me. And I don't know, you may ace all three of these, but that last one's the one I, I struggle with the most. And it's the one that God calls me to every day to be a person of joy, to know and learn his ways and to walk in his ways. And so tonight, as we close up tonight, I, I, I want us to, to just think about this, that, um, that we would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. And, and, and let me just kind of close this out with these last verses giving thanks to the Father who qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. There's incredible knowledge in, in that. I, I would pray that knowledge would propel you into action. And would call you into a deeper walk of not just knowing, but doing. And as you are going through your daily life, that you would walk and work and understand his ways.